Welcome to episode three of the Strategy Sessions. My name is Andy Jarvis. I'm your host for the next hour, and I am also the Strategy Director at Eximo Marketing. Thank you for coming along. This is your USA edition. Uh, somebody cue the Star Spangled Banner. Yeah, I'm not Beyonce, so let's not worry about that. Uh, we have got uh, two guests today from uh, the United States of America. We've got Greg Gifford, the man with the best beard in the industry, and Rand Fishkin, the man with the best hair in the industry. Um, and also two of the nicest men you'll ever wish to meet coming from, I think it's Austin, Texas, and Seattle, Washington. If you are interested in local search, in a couple of minutes time, Greg's gonna give you a top tip that will help save your life. And then Rand is the focus of the main interview. We talk about uh, founding a tech company. Uh, he was behind Moz, he was behind Spark Toro, or is behind Spark Toro. Uh, also writing his book, Lost and Founder, Life in America, and various other issues. Uh, along the way so uh, an enjoyable interview for me to conduct and I really hope you enjoy it uh, before that I need to uh, I've waited a long time to say this I have a message from our sponsor yeah that's right we got a sponsor now so two episodes in or three now we've got a sponsor if you're watching on YouTube you'll see I'm holding up a bag of Moyi coffee in a bright pink bag let me give it a squeeze there you go that's Moyi Coffee. Um, so really pleased to have them on board. They are a coffee company, obviously based in Dublin, based in Amsterdam. And I first met one of the founders near Christmas time at an event in Belfast about blockchain. Uh, they use blockchain to help connect the drinkers uh, in Europe, mainly to the farmers in Africa, in Ethiopia and Kenya, where they buy most of their product from, uh, in a way to try and kind of make a connection between drinker and farmer. But uh, that's not why I started drinking the coffee. I met the founder. It sounded like a nice story, and I tried the coffee, and it was great. That was my main uh, my main starting point, my jump off point. Um, I've since tried all the different coffees: the single origin, double, triple, and the dark roast. Personally, this one that I've got in my hand, the triple, is my favourite. But give it a go, try your own, and you'll find your own favourite. Really, really great coffee. Uh, so yeah, I was pumped when they wanted to come on board as part of the podcast. So. Um, yeah, there's a campaign going on at the moment called Protect the Chain. So Moyi are kind of values driven as a company. They are trying, they don't just buy from Kenya and Ethiopia. They also uh, roast the coffee there as well. So what they're trying to do is keep more money, jobs and profits in those markets rather than exporting it over here. And they're working with 450 farmers on a road to try and hit uh, a living income for them. And at the minute, they're, some of their orders have disappeared. So they sell a lot to um, tech companies and to serviced offices like WeWorks and places like that. I don't know if it's actually a WeWork, but you know, th that type of approach. And obviously there's nobody in there at the moment. So they are trying to keep the volumes up so that they can commit to buying the same amount of coffee that they said they would do at the beginning of the year. So they have an offer on at the minute. It's, if you look at hashtag protect the chain, what they have is if you buy two kilos of coffee, so the bag I was holding earlier is a kilo bag, you buy two kilos of coffee, you get a kilo free. What that does is it helps them keep the commitment they made to keep the same volume of coffee. So if you do drink a lot of coffee, because let's be honest, three kilos is an awful lot of coffee. If you do drink a lot of coffee, it's for you. If you want to share it with a mate or you want to give somebody a bag, have a look. It's Moyi Coffee. You'll find them at Moyi Coffee, which is M-O-Y-E-E -E, Coffee, C-O-F-F-E-E, -E, but you knew that anyway, dot I-E or dot co dot UK. Moyi Coffee dot I-E or Moyi Coffee dot co dot UK. Uh, so please do check them out. Um, really great coffee. As I've said, I think that's enough advertising for now. So you wanted a top tip and I know you love the theme tune, so I'm going to sing that for you. Are you ready? Are you ready for a T O P T I P? T O P T I P? T O P T I P? Uh, yes, you are. All the way from Austin, Texas, here's Gres Greg Gifford. Hey, it's Greg Gifford, Vice President of Search at Search Lab Digital. And my tip is for local businesses. Your Google My Business listing is your new homepage. It's the first impression you make with potential customers. So you need to make sure it's optimized. Pick the right phone number. Make sure a local number's listed, upload photos, upload videos, make your profile rock. Want to use a tracking number? Put your tracking number in the primary slot and your local number in the alternate slot. 
Make sure you add UTM tracking to your website link so you get correct attribution in Google Analytics. UTM source should be GMB listing and UTM medium should be organic. Want to learn more about local search in GMB? Check out my weekly tip video series at searchlabdigital.com slash local dash search dash Tuesdays. Greg, thank you very much. Uh, look, as Greg mentioned in that piece there, uh, please do check out Local Search Tuesdays. Uh, if you're in America, obviously, in Canada, Tuesdays, as Greg said. But uh, if you're not, it's Tuesday, like the rest of us. Uh, please do go and check it out. I am uh, happy to say that this top tip feature is a shameless ripoff of uh, Local Search Tuesdays. Um, I asked Greg, I was like, I'm featured in one of them, uh, probably October uh, 2019, and said, look, Greg, love the feature. Do you mind if I just lift like a little bit of that and take it into the podcast? And he was like, yeah, man, it's fine. <laughs> it's not my idea, is it? It's just an idea of getting content lessons from other people. But yeah, I shamelessly nicked it from there. So Local Search Tuesdays, really good idea. Uh, you'll find it online. Greg Gifford, you won't miss him. Look for the beard and the tattoos and he's there. Anyway, um, we said this is the USA edition. And I want to talk a little bit now before we get into the Rand interview about the United States of America. Of what's going on in America at the moment. Um, I interviewed Rand, it's probably close to two weeks ago now. Um, Greg sent his piece through, again, similar sort of timescale, maybe longer. This was supposed to be a positive, upbeat edition about uh, marketing and about tapping into expertise from some of the brightest people in America. But I thought long and hard and thought, do I just shelve the whole episode? Do we keep the episode? What do we do? And this felt like the best way um, to just say how it's made me feel with what's happened in America and what's happened to George Floyd and subsequently with the, the demonstrations and the protests afterwards. Initially, I was numb. I saw the photograph on social media and I didn't want to see any more. I have no desire to see people murdered, whether it's by police or by anybody else. I have no desire to see that. And it made the evening news and the video was shown there with, with the, the man, George Floyd, I'll say his name, laid on the floor with a police officer with a knee on his neck. And it made me numb. I was, ang I was angry a bit, but mainly just numb. I think a cop had killed another guy, but I was numb. Another black man was dead, but I was numb. And I, it's taken me the best part of a week to work out why. And it, it was the slow, calculated nature of it that I did that. I'm, weirdly, and I don't mean this to sound, to sound like it's disrespecting other people who've been killed by the police, but I think I've desensitized a little bit to people, to black people being shot by American police. There's kind of an instant thing, there's an instant decision to pull your gun out and shoot, and it happens, and you see it on the news, and you just think, do you know, we've got this ridiculous gun culture in the US, and if you're going to have a ridiculous gun culture, you're going to have people killed. And you become a little bit desensitized to it, which is an awful thing to say, but it gets normalized. But this was different. This was a man pleading for his life on the floor with a cop with his knee on his neck. And then the numbness went. And I got angry. And I'm still angry now. And I couldn't just record a happy piece about marketing and tourism and go and visit the US and here's what I would do post-COVID. Because I'm angry. I'm angry that another man died, another black man died because the US police see a suspect, see a criminal first and a person second, maybe not even second, maybe third. It was a slow, deliberate killing and I think that's what fired up the protests. That's what made people come out on the streets. This isn't another shooting and there's lots of them. There's lots of other ones. I can't remember the names, there's been so many of them. But George Floyd was different. This was slow. This was deliberate. And people are on the streets. And then I log on to social media and I see people saying, well, you know, I, I understand the demonstrations, but the rioters have to stop. And, and there's part of that I, I understand. And you kind of internalize it and you play and you go, hey, okay, you know, rioting's violence. It's not helping anybody. And, and I 
hand on heart, I don't think I'd be rioting. If I was in America, I'd be out on the streets demonstrating. Would I be rioting? No, I don't think so. But am I going to tell those people that they're doing the wrong thing by rioting? No, I'm not. They're protesting against the system. And you can't protest against the system only in the way the system says you can do it. No, don't be daft. This isn't a broken system, by the way, in America. This is the system working exactly as it's supposed to do. It's supposed to work like this. I was talking to an American academic two days ago who explained to me about how the funding of the school system works. It's funded by property taxes in the local area. You live in a poor area, you have poor taxes, you have poor schools. Poverty is copper fastened in the US because of the funding model. The best way to increase social mobility is through education. But the education is funded by local property taxes, so it, 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 the system just perpetuates. This is the system working exactly as it is supposed to do in America. And then you wonder why black people are on the streets. You wonder why people are rioting. Okay. I hear people say, look, the strategy sessions, it's a marketing podcast. I'll give you some marketing then. Don't start spouting off about rioting and tell me, oh, it's the rioters out on the streets. If you want to bring some marketing logic to it, segment your audience. How many people were out on the streets? How many people were rioting? And you're backing away with your support of the protests because a handful of minority were rioting. Okay, I see you. And let's be honest, riots do not happen out of thin air. Certain conditions continue to exist in society which must be condemned as vigorously as we condemn riots. Because in the final analysis, a riot is the language of the unheard. And what has America failed to hear? It's failed to hear the plight of the black poor has worsened over the last few years. It's failed to hear the promise of freedom and justice has not been met. And it's failed to hear that large segments of white society are more concerned about tranquility and the status quo than about justice, equality and humanity. That's not me. It's Martin Luther King in 1968. The only word I changed was the word black, because he said Negro. And I didn't change it for sensibility reasons. I just changed it for effect, so that it would sound more like something I would say. 1968, that could have been read out yesterday, and it would have still sounded perfect. There's a situation in America that has been allowed to flourish because of incumbent in the White House. President Trump, Donald Trump, I'm not even going to give him the title president. Donald Trump is in the White House. And he's made it okay for white nationalists. He's, he's, let's be honest, let's call it what it is. The man is a white nationalist in the White House and it makes me angry. He stands there in his ill-fitting suits with his ridiculous hair and it fastens his tie like an eight-year-old would. But the comedy, but us laughing at him, puts a soft veneer on the fact that the man is a white nationalist in the White House. And he's there. And we laugh. And you think, are we actually just helping to perpetuate this? Because we laugh at him because he's, he's so cringeworthy, you can ridicule him all the time. But actually, what are we doing? We're softening the image of a white nationalist. And I'm angry about it. I go on Facebook, I go on Twitter. The first rule of the internet is never read the comments, right? And I've broken my own first rule. And you go into the comments and you see people arguing. You see, why are we demonstrating in Britain? What's this got to do with Britain? And you go, what's this got to do with Britain? And you go, well, okay, maybe they're the land of the free, right? <laughs> Don't make me laugh, land of the free. Um... And yeah, you have black people having to teach the kids to put the hands up when the police come. To put the hands up and tell them they're not a threat to them. And I don't have to do that here. I don't have to tell that to my daughter. I don't walk around. I'm in Northern Ireland, the PSNI. I don't walk past the police on the streets here and think, are they going to take a gun out and shoot me? Are they going to treat me as a criminal first? I don't think that. I don't feel that here. But that doesn't mean that there aren't people in the UK who don't think that. You talk to people in London who are ethnic minorities who are black and they worry about the police in those ways. They worry about being arrested. They worry about stop and search being disproportionately used against them because they are assumed to be guilty. Right? 
And I don't have that fear where I am. I don't. But I have. I sat on the tube in London just after the uh, 7-11 attacks. Not just after. A couple of months after. I was on the tube going south towards Stockwell where the Met shot Jean-Charles de Menes. And apologies about the pronunciation of his name. I've probably got it wrong. And unless you've sat on a tube with a rucksack on your back and looked at armed police getting on that tube and thought, shit, there's a chance I might not get off this tube today. Don't tell me racism doesn't exist in this country. Don't tell me we shouldn't be going out marching in solidarity in support of what's going on in America. Right? Because racism happens in this country. If you want to know what it's like, if you've got a black friend, because every racist seems to have a black friend, go and ask him what it's like, or go and ask her what it's like to try and get through an airport, right? It's a running joke with me and my friends, with people I travel with, that random test. Oh, Mr. Jarvis, there's a random test. Come on. Yeah, and I'm angry about it. It's not funny anymore. I'm fed up of losing my shit with people at airports because I'm randomly selected again. When you fly three and four times a week, it gets tiring. So don't tell me racism doesn't exist in this country, right? We just do racism differently to the Americans. They stand in the front of you and scream it in your face. In Britain, we wear nicer suits and better ties and whisper about it behind you. That's how racism looks here. Study after study after study shows that if you have a name that makes you sound like an ethnic minority on your uh, CV, resume, if you listen to America, um, shows that you have less chance of being shortlisted for that job because your name sounds different. They don't even know what you look like at that stage, but your name sounds different. There were studies in the 60s, in the 70s, in the 80s, in the 90s, in the noughties, a study recently, and they all show the same thing. You make people sound whiter on their CV, they get more of a chance of an interview. A friend of mine, Luke Carthy, made a post recently where he said he sat in the reception of a business and people walked in and went, oh, is Luke Carthy here? He's the only guy sat in reception. But because he's black, people didn't think it should be him who should be there for that. I'd forgotten so many experiences like that. When people look at you and go, oh, you're Andy. You don't sound like you should be. Well, what? What should I sound like? Should I come bouncing in and go, where Andy white women? And I'm angry about it. You got twice as likely if you're black in London to be given a fine for breaching COVID guidelines than if you're white. You got Noel Clark, an actor who's in Fisherman's Friend. His name's across the top as a star of the show, but they've chopped him out of the picture for the front of the DVD. That's happened to me, and people go, oh, it's a composition issue, Andy. It's not race. You're just playing the race card, mate. So don't tell me it doesn't happen, happen here. Northern Ireland, where I'm sat now, let me get the numbers. People talk about sectarianism because it's the main problem here in Northern Ireland. Catholics and Protestants, Catholics and Protestants. I get that. 2017, 1,025 race attacks in Northern Ireland. 879 sectarian attacks. They're the figures from the police. More race race attacks than sectarian attacks. What's the population of non-white people in Northern Ireland? 31,000. What's the population of everyone else? 1.8 million. Don't tell me we don't have a race problem here. Right? Don't tell me that. We've got people from the Windrush generation being deported. We've got Grenfell Tower where we've been told, oh, well, they, should have, they shouldn't have followed instructions. Oh, if they'd have followed instructions. Yeah, it's because no one cares because it was black people that died. That's a tower full of white people. It's a different thing. You've got Megan leaving the country because of the way she's been hounded by the media. I'll post it in the show notes. 15 examples. There's one example where Megan's holding a bump and it's disgraceful, she's just virtue signaling. When Kate was pregnant and holding her bump, oh, isn't it lovely, isn't it motherhood? This is what racism looks like in this country. It's pernicious, it's whispering about you in corners. And this happens day after day after day. And people say, why are you protesting about what's happened in America? What's that got to do with here? We're about to leave the European Union. Doesn't matter whether you want it or whether you don't, it's happening, right? And what are we going to do? We're going to sign a trade agreement with America, with this country, the land of the free. No, it's not. 
It's the land of the free if you're white and if you've got money. That's what that is. And what we're going to do, we're about to become the junior partner with that. I'm angry. I'm annoyed. I'm sad. I'm numb. I'm upset. I've just got... I've never, ever felt like this about the death of somebody who I don't know. Never felt like this before. And it's got to stop. What can we do? I don't know. What is me spouting on a podcast going to do about it? I don't know. But I've got to do something. I've got to try and make a small difference. Somehow or other. Now, what's this got to do with marketing? I, marketing's a people discipline, mate. We're all people. And we've got to understand that we're all people in this. You understand people, you'll be better at marketing. Right? If you don't like this sort of thing, fine. Thank you for listening. Piss off. Don't come back. I don't mind. Honestly, I don't care. Coming up now, we're going to get back to talking about marketing. That if you came to listen to Rand Fishkin, is about to start. Yeah, we talk about life in America a little bit. We talk about marketing. We talk about Spark Toro. We talk about various things. And we talk about Trump as well. Because work and life aren't two things that sit in separate pots. It's what we do. It's who we are. It's part of us. So thank you for listening. I'm going to keep talking about this. I'm maybe going to see if I can do some special things about this. I don't know what I can do, but I'm going to try and do something. Thank you very much for listening. And listen, listen around now. We'll get back to marketing. Thank you. Fishkin, Rand, how are you? Good, Andy. Thanks for having me. Oh, uh, listen, the pleasure is all mine. Um, if you don't know Rand, Rand is the co-founder of Spark Toro, which we'll talk about shortly. The author of this book, if you're watching on YouTube, Lost and Founder, and uh, probably best known, I think it's fair to say, at the moment as the founder of Moz. And also a man with hair that makes me incredibly jealous uh, as somebody who's going bald. <laughs> but um, let's start talking about Spark Toro first. Let's start at the, where we are now and work backwards. What was the thinking? What was the thought process behind the product you've just launched recently? What what took you into launching Spark Toro? Yeah, yeah. So um, Casey and I, my co-founder and I, talked talk to a bunch of folks who uh, essentially did this market research to try and figure out where their audiences paid attention. Right. So Andy, if you and I are helping, you know, let's say we're consultants and we're we're helping a business um, try to. Uh, brand their company and get in front of the people who are likely to be customers, we can do that one of two ways, right? We can either go to Google and Facebook and just let them do all the targeting for us, right? Throw money at them, let them take care of it. Or we can try and go direct, right? We can try and figure out, okay, what are the podcasts that this audience that we're targeting listens to? Uh, what are the YouTube channels they subscribe to? What are the websites they visit? What are the social accounts they follow? What are the conferences and events that they go to? What are the email newsletters they subscribe to, right? All, all those kinds of things. And then let's go do targeting of all kinds. Like we might be able to do some organic marketing that won't cost us anything that'll have huge ROI. Maybe we can do some more creative paid marketing that, you know, co-marketing types of things or sponsorships or uh, uh, partnerships that could have huge ROI. How do you do that? How do you figure out, like we, we asked a lot of people, how do you figure out what your audience pays attention to? And the answer was, uh, I sort of get a feel for it, right? The answer was no scientific process, except for a few folks, right? A few of the folks at um, very large companies with big budgets said, we hire a market research firm for 50 to $100,000 they put together a big uh, research report, which is based on survey data. And, you know, Casey and I had this like survey data, but it's so biased. Self-reported answers to these questions are gonna be terrible. And they're like, yeah, we do the best we can. And then there was the really sophisticated folks who basically took a list of their customers' emails, they plugged them into a service like Full Contact to get all of their social accounts, then they went and crawled all those social accounts, put them in a database, and looked at everything they followed, shared, linked to on their Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, Reddit, YouTube, Medium, whatever, like whatever social networks they could. And those produced 
awesome results. Awesome results. Like the, the, the companies that were doing that, granted, huge budgets, like developer time, all that kind of stuff, but amazing results. And Casey and I said, that, we can build that at scale for everybody. And so that's what we have. We have this giant database of tens of millions of uh, social and web profiles that are um, all indexed, right? Their text contents index, what they follow and share and link to, and um, sort of that, that graph, that network graph uh, is indexed. And then you can search and say, okay, tell me what architects in Los Angeles listen to. Tell me what um, web marketers in the UK follow. Tell me what uh, people who, are, who describe themselves as audiophiles in Europe uh, what brands they interact with, right? And, and SparkToro can tell you that. And so now that targeting exercise that was so difficult is reduced from, you know, months to minutes. Mm -hmm. So you're solving a real customer need there about being out and understanding what your customer wants and then being able to solve that need uh, with a tech product, which helps you then with, I suppose, scaling as people start to onboard and you can start to uh, to hopefully ramp up because you've just launched. Um, in, in terms of, you know, tech products have great balance sheets when they start to work and when they start to scale, I suppose. So um, how has the launch gone for you? It's, uh, you know, you've a long time in development and now you're out in, into the wild. Yeah, uh, let's see. So the um, the sad part is we know a little bit we did we did our first early access cohort just before the pandemic and so we know how that cohort performed versus the subsequent cohorts and yeah i mean massive difference right mm -hmm. like literally 10x so we had about a five percent conversion rate pre-pandemic we have a 0 0.5 percent conversion rate post-pandemic yeah. um and you know i uh, i was talking to um someone else, a friend earlier today, and, and Andy was, was commenting, I was commenting to them that the worst part, like the hardest part, I'm sure you've seen this too, it's just heartbreaking. So we have this big email list, right? Like 20,000 people who said, yeah, notify me when the product's ready. And as the cohort started rolling through, a higher and higher percentage of those emails bounced back and a higher and higher percentage had the autoresponder, not I'm out of office, but I've been let go from this role or I'm no longer with the company. Mm -hmm. And just seeing the scale of that, the scale of that going to like 15% of our list, no longer working at the company they worked at, whatever, three, six, nine months ago. Oh my God, just heartbreaking. And I, th I think those things start to bring a reality to the stats because I, uh, I forget, I think is it 20 million people in the US extra are now on uh, social security. The numbers aren't quite as staggering percentage-wise or in, in actual numbers in the UK, but still a huge growth. But you almost get, a, you know, 20 million is a number. It, what, what does that actually mean? Well, that's 20 million families, isn't it? That, that's the bit you forget about when you see these big stats. Uh, so my understanding as of last Friday, it was 33 million. Uh, 33 million Americans, which is more than 10% of the country, um, you know, who have, who have uh, recently lost their jobs, right? Recently become unemployed. And currently, 50% uh, of Americans between the age of 18 and 65 do not have full-time work, right? And that, that half of those people are people who sort of dropped out of the labor force. They're not actively looking. Mm -hmm. um, and half of those are people who are looking but can't find a job. <laughs> it's just, your mind can't wrap around it, right? It's yeah. sort of like, I don't know, do you ever have this experience? You like go to the movies, right? or you're watching a movie on TV and it's, um, it's like one of the Avengers, one of the Marvel movies, right? And some terrible big bad guy comes and like blows up a whole city. And it's like, oh my God, 7 million people were killed. Whoa, right? And what do we all do? We, we're all like, whoa, that bad guy is strong, <laughs> right? Not, not, oh my God, those poor 7 million people. But then we watch, you know, we watch a movie like Up and at the beginning of Up, one old lady dies, mm -hmm. right? One old lady who's had a very happy long life married to her husband, dies, she's a cartoon lady, and she dies, and everybody in the theater is weeping, just weeping. Yeah, that's, how we, that's how human beings are, right? We can, yeah. we can get around, we can empathize with one person, we have a really hard time with 33 million people. 
I, and um, I, I think Stalin said it best. And it's not often you quote Stalin on marketing <laughs> podcasts, but uh, I, I think he, to misquote him slightly, he said, one death is a tragedy, a million deaths is a statistic. Um, now, yeah. he was talking about wiping out a whole race, so I'm not trying to belittle it, but the quote itself is, is very accurate. Um, and was- Absolutely. And people think about it that way too, right? If I know, if one of my friends, I, I had a cousin, um, four weeks ago now, four weeks ago, died of COVID in New York City, right? During the height of their, their outbreak. Uh, last week, a friend of a friend of ours who, you know, we'd, we'd been to parties with her and, and knew her, she, she passed away from COVID as well, right? And those, those two deaths, right? Those two people that I knew, not super well, I hadn't seen my cousin in a long time. I was a second cousin and, um, and a friend of a friend who also hadn't seen in maybe a decade. But those two deaths feel really, um, you know, feel so massive when the, you know, um, what is it now? A hundred, almost a hundred thousand people in the United States have died from, from coronavirus. And that, you know, that number is just, it's a statistic, right? It doesn't feel the same. It's heartbreaking. You know, it, I, I want to have the same empathy that I have for these people that I knew who died, but I, it's hard. I don't, I don't know how to do that. I, and it, it is, you're right, it's difficult. I'm sorry to hear about, about that. And it, it's, a, it's a story you hear repeated in, in different places about the, the loved ones dying. And there was an old sort of mantra in, in the British press, um, sort of back in the, in the heydays of the print media, 70s and 80s. And it, it was something along the lines of one death in Putney in London uh, will get reported, two deaths in Paris will get reported, 10 deaths in Portugal, uh, and 100 deaths in Paraguay, or it, it was something yeah. like that. And it yeah. was basically kind of valuing the scale of, of human life to the British public based on yeah. where that person was and died. Um, and, and that was it. And it, it's a very strange part of the human condition, isn't it? How we desensitize ourselves to, to others. It, it's very strange. No, it a- absolutely is. And, you know, I think that the one thing I, I will say, I think that the UK, after initially having a lot of challenges around their, their COVID response, um, and obviously you would know this better than I would, right? So I'm just, I'm just um, interpreting the news that, that we see over here, but uh, it feels like the public over there in, in a lot of Europe, with maybe the exception of Sweden, um, in most of South and Latin America, with the possible exception of Mexico and Brazil, um, in most of Asia, overwhelmingly, uh, you know, there's just a ton of togetherness, right? People sort of recognizing, hey, this is high risk for a bunch of people. And so I am going to sacrifice my behavior. And yes, I recognize it hurts the economy and it might hurt my job. It might hurt like me personally. And I'm stuck at home, you know, with my kids and I'm stuck at home um, not being able to do the things I want and getting the things I want. And I'm willing to make those sacrifices for other people. Right for other people's safety and health, and and actually that's true in the U.S. It's kind of like mostly like 60, 65 percent of Americans are are doing that pretty well, and then you know there's sort of we we have a we have a very weird society here, um, and you know Brazil sort of similar situation, uh, Mexico a little bit too, but yeah, it, um, it is remarkable to see people coming together for people they don't know. You know, I look at I look at countries like. Um, Canada and Australia and New Zealand and Austria and Germany and you know Italy, uh, which is where most of my wife's family is, um, and yeah, it's remarkable. And I think one thing that that stands out talking to you and, and from reading the book is that you're an incredibly values-driven person, and that comes across you know in in this opening discussion about COVID. And I want to talk to you about how you instill instill the values that you talk about at Moss. Um, TAGFI um, was the acronym that you used and uh, can you sort of explain a little bit uh, without giving away it all because people still need to buy the book but um, can you explain a little bit about TAGFI and how you kind of made it stick in the organization? Yeah yeah so um, TAGFI was this we went through this exercise you and I were talking before the before the podcast about uh, Jim's Jim Collins book Good to Great and um you know, he has this exercise in there about building core values for your company because he points out that, that um, correlation-wise, companies that have and live and represent their core values very strongly internally and externally tend to survive much longer, tend to be much more successful long-term than those that don't. And, uh, and so we, we sort of said, hey, let's, 
Let, let's do this in Moz, let's build this. And um, that exercise resulted in these six, six values, tag fee. Most people probably are most familiar with Moz's uh, values around transparency, right? Mm -hmm. The T in tag fee stands for transparency. There's a bunch of other ones, but um, that was a process where we basically, we did this when there was only 10 or 11 of us on the team. And um, the, the author of Tag Fee, the person who created it, was, was actually Geraldine, my wife, um, which you can, can sort of feel in there, her, her voice and work um, in the original Tag Fee document, which you can find on the Moz blog from years ago. I think they still have it up. Uh, and then, yeah, over time, we just built it into more and more parts of the company, internally and externally. So around decision making, we would say, is X you know, decision Tag Fee? And if it's not, let's not do it. Um, and we did that around things like uh, pricing and how we did can how we managed cancellations. We did it around uh, who we would work with and not work with. Um, we did it on sponsorships. We did it on uh, uh, team selection, right? So we we brought it into how we hired people. We eventually brought it into the process of how we um, recognized and rewarded folks internally. So the mm -hmm. the performance reviews, right? We're, we're sort of tag fee based values built in there. Uh, we had a tag fee screening process that people went through when they were interviewed for the company. So we baked it into a lot of parts of the organization. And I think that's how it, it kind of seeped in. Mm -hmm. um, that being said, you know, I won't say it with, wasn't without its challenges. It definitely, you know, it has, um, it has big pluses. It also has drawbacks, right? I think people can uh, misinterpret and misuse values to be able to, uh, I, I don't know, um, read, you know, read decisions as not being tag fee and then criticize the organization or, or read decisions as, uh, or, or be able to use the values in a way that they weren't intended to, mm -hmm. um, you know, not necessarily uh, contribute in the best ways or treat their team members the best. And I, it's uh, I, I values driven organizations. It's one of the things I look for when I work with clients is do, do their values uh, align with mine. Now I'm a company of one, so it's me, yeah. not just the company, but I, I you know, I've started, I, I, there's an XML way of doing things, which is on the website. Um, and it was important that I set that up from an early stage. I'm interested in kind of how values stick as the company scales and grows. And one of them, um, one of the examples you give me in the book is about Johnson and Johnson with um, uh, their values and how it's kind of uh, their CEO talks about how it's inherent for them and baked into the company. Now, since then, Johnson and Johnson have been uh, handing over lots of dollars in the, in the millions for their uh, opioid scandal and billions for their talc issue. How do you make sure that uh, it's a slightly different example, but you know, were you aware that as the company got bigger and bigger and more people came in that it could have just been, just the letters on the wall rather than anything else. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. In fact, I, I, I felt that, right. I felt that and it, um, uh, had bugged the shit out of me. Right. <laughs> and, um, I, th I think very frankly, one of the reasons that spark Toro is such a small company, right. Just Casey and I, and you know, Casey and I had a conversation, like I never want to run a company of more than 50 people again. I, I just don't have any interest in it. Um, I don't really like big, I like small, mm -hmm. Right, I like um, I like the nimbleness that comes with being small. I like the uh, concept of many many small businesses making up an economy. Right, so if I were if I were designing a perfect, you know, world economy, it would be many small businesses, not a few powerful ones. Um, I, I think monopoly practices are really dangerous. I think, generally speaking, antitrust law is not as fairly or as applied as often as it should be. Um, we can talk about Google in that respect, or or Amazon, or uh, Facebook certainly, um, and and my uh, you know my desire is not to be a hypocrite, right? I don't I don't want to build something that I don't want to see in the world. I think mm -hmm. that's both true from like a values perspective, but it's also true from a um, I don't get excited about it, and it's really hard to do good work when you're not excited about something. You know, I think some people are like purely driven by yeah, maybe I have my values and I like vote for those things or whatever or support charities or whatnot. But in my business, I am excited exclusively about making money, right? And and having prestige. And so my goal is the biggest company I possibly can making the most money I possibly can. 
right, you know, that's not, that doesn't excite me. And so I'm not going to work hard to get that. Like, that's not, it doesn't interest me. Um, so yeah, look, I mean, money can solve a lot of problems, but after a certain level, I don't know, like I have, you know, we have this nice house in Seattle and, you know, we have a, a good life and a Netflix subscription and good internet and, you know, we can afford to do most of the things that we want to do. I'm not really sure. Like, okay, I, I guess we could go to fancier hotels or fly business class instead of coach. Meh. <laughs> right. I don't, I don't know. That doesn't get me super excited, but building a company, building a company that represents what I want to see in the world, right? What I'd like to see more of making an example for other entrepreneurs, other founders, solving marketers problems so that small you know marketers at small consultancies at small businesses can do the same thing that, that the ones of those big businesses could do yeah that gets me excited right i'm pumped about that i, I want to do that in my life and so i can do good work around it brilliant brilliant no i love that and uh, i think it comes across you know when that passion's there you can do better work and it, it just doesn't feel like a hassle getting out of bed in the morning it's uh, it's yeah. been liberating starting my own company was brilliant for that i just uh, bounce out of bed every day now it's fantastic yeah yeah and like I, I have plenty of i have plenty of you know mental health challenging days but overall right overall when i look at the big picture the the arc of what i hope my future and the future of spark taro and sort of the story that people will tell after I'm dead can be, I, I want to be proud of that, right? And I have a, I have a really hard time um, wanting to do something that wouldn't make me proud there. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I, I guess some people, it doesn't matter to them. Um, and I think for, unfortunately, for a lot of people, probably Andy, I'm sure you've seen this too, right? In, in the UK, maybe not as much as the US, but um, for a lot of people, it, it feels like uh, there's no choice, right? Either, you know, either you sacrifice values and and work toward making as much money as you can, or sort of the the, the late stage capitalism world will beat you down. Yeah, and there's a point I think as well where you get onto the treadmill, and th there's maybe a point early in your career where you're possibly still living at home on low overheads or whatever. But once you hit a certain salary point, the jump just becomes too frightening, doesn't it? And you just end up stuck and bound by everything else, by by circumstance more than anything else. But um, yeah, the treadmill is a good way to put yeah, it. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> So I want to dive in. I, I'm not going to sort of read every page of the book um, out to the audience because we're going to, we've got a competition coming at the end of this to give a copy of the book away. Um, but there's a couple of bits I want to dive into, uh, particularly the bit where you talk about marketing hacks and how they hack to launch one of the products, which I can't remember and I didn't write down, but I'm sure you'll tell me how it worked it, to an extent. It was successful. Mm. It, it brought people on board. Um, but the long-term pain from that short-term win. Um, can you talk to us about the hack and you know the, the long-term implications it had for you? Yeah, yeah. This was a this was a super early uh, kind of an email marketing hack for us. I guess email marketing and discount hack. And it's something uh, strangely enough, Casey and I had a conversation about whether we should do something like it again for SparkToro and, and decided against it. But um, so this was in two thousand nine. Uh, I was trying to raise a second round of funding for what was called SEO Moz at the time. It would be re renamed Moz maybe a couple of years later. Um, and we essentially had this software product that was working really, really well for a lot of folks, right? Or onboarding a ton of uh, people and sort of growing at this, this nice rate of you know, 50, 75% year over year, maybe even higher than that. Uh, and we had an, a big email list that we had never touched before. I think, I want to say it was like maybe somewhere in the 50 to 70,000 people range, right? Basically all these people who'd signed up on the website for like to get access to some of our free tools and the blog and other things. Anyway, we, we put up this huge list together and I sent an email from my personal email address that was um, try SEO Moz Pro, the, the like paid version of the software, um, for $1, like your first month is just $1. We, we had, we didn't have a free trial before that. So this was like our first foray into this. Um, that resulted in 
I want to say like 4,000 new people signing up in the first month. Um, one of the other unintentional hacks was uh, there was a mistake in the email. In the, in the first email I sent out, I, I'm trying to, I can't remember the. Oh, uh, it was, there was no um, uh, cancel anytime. Right, right, yeah. right. There was no cancel anytime. And so I was getting hundreds of replies. Um, I remember I was actually in San Diego at my wife's aunt's like little beach house uh, in Ocean Beach. And, and Geraldine and I were both logged into my email trying to reply to emails fast enough. And they were coming in so much faster than we could, we could hit reply. Um, we had two laptops and we were sort of back to back there. And, and the, uh, so we sent out a second email that was like, I made a mistake with the $1 offer, right? Was, I think that was the, the title of the email. That ended up converting almost as many people or more than the first one. Mm -hmm. um, I think because the subject line really got through like every single spam filter. <laughs> And, uh, and everybody clicked on like, oh, what was the mistake? I, I'm so curious about what this mistake was. Anyway, unfortunately, um, over the next few years, a bunch of marketers picked up on the send an email intentionally with a mistake and then email about how you're apologizing for the mistake. Mm -hmm. I, I hate that. But regardless, right? So this was early on enough that that was not a technique yet. And so, um, yeah, it worked extraordinarily well. But then when you looked at the cohort's performance, it resulted in a ton of signups, but also an incredibly high churn rate. And a lot of people who tried the product, and of course the product was not right for them or they weren't right for the product or whatever you want to say about that, but as a result, they went away unhappy, right? So we, what we did was rather than convert people who were right customers and who would love the product, we converted probably 10% you know, of the people who signed up were those and 90% of the people who signed up were wrong customers or the product wasn't right for them. It didn't do what they wanted. And so they left unhappy. And of course, over the next few years, they did not try it again because they'd had a bad experience, right? And we lost them as potential customers because their first experience was not great. Mm -hmm. So that, you know, I think that's the danger of the, of the hack system, right? Is that you get in, I don't know, sort of burn your list, burn your credibility. Um, it's one of the reasons that I don't, I don't really encourage folks to try and get people, you know, founders to get people onto their product unless it's right for them and unless it's sort of polished and ready because you, you can burn your reputation, especially in a small niche. Like SEO is pretty small niche back in 2009. Mm -hmm. And I think it's one of the things you said, uh, you mentioned in the book about using scarcity, discounting, time-based uh, incentives and things. And it's one of the things I talk about, and I think you've probably seen this one at conferences about uh, how people stack these together and, and try and um, you know, make, make a compelling proposition. But I think the key that you, that you found out at that point was that you were getting the, into the wrong kind of relationship with clients. And instead you develop this concept of the marketing flywheel for Moz. Um, again, do you want to, it's no point me telling people, people want to listen to you. So can you, do you want to tell us about the flywheel um, from Moz and what is that flywheel like for Spark Toro? Have you taken something similar? Yeah, yeah. So um, I am actually, I'm in the process of publishing a, writing a blog post uh, about the marketing flywheel because I think this is a concept that more folks need to be aware of and pay attention to. But the idea is that you, you build up a, a single practice, if you're small, or a set of practices, uh, you know, marketing tactics and channels that scale with decreasing friction and that build upon each other. So, so scale with decreasing friction means I keep putting in the same amount of effort uh, regularly and I get more out of it each time because it grows my audience or it, lo it lowers the friction between awareness and conversion or it lowers... Um, the cost per acquisition, right? And, and what you want to do is get that flywheel started uh, and, then, and then turn it again and again and again until it is, um, you, you don't ever necessarily even stop, right? You're, you're just seeking that, uh, that leverage point and, and that builds a true competitive advantage in marketing for you. Mm -hmm. So Moz, for, for folks um, who might know it, right? Moz is flywheel was basically an SEO and content flywheel. This is not the only flywheel. I've seen tons of people do it with a PR flywheel or an ads plot flywheel or an events, event marketing flywheel or whatever, right? But, but Moz really used this idea that, uh, you know, I would blog mostly. Uh, 
I would have some intuition about what people wanted. I'd do some keyword research. I'd put up a blog post. That blog post would get distributed on our social channels, on our email, on our RSS. More people would subscribe via email to our blog once they found that post and they liked it, right? If they liked it, more people would subscribe to our social channels if they got amplified by other social accounts, right? LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and then we would uh, get some links to that blog post, which would help us rank better in Google for all of our keywords that we were going after. And the next post I published would be slightly easier to reach a bigger audience, slightly easier to rank in Google, slightly easier to get amplified on social, slightly easier to grow our audience on social. And that would keep going and going, right? So every post I published contributed a little bit, a little bit, a little bit. And yeah, eventually that did, that did awesomely well for the company. The, one of the big keys there was sort of balancing the top of funnel content like content that was designed to be amplified versus content that was just designed to be helpful to our existing community. And we, we really had to play both in order to get that flywheel spinning. Yeah. I, I think uh, one of the key lessons that I took from the book and, uh, you know, would share with, with anyone listening, I tend to have a lot of, uh, I do some work at universities and speak at a few conferences like you, I tend to get a lot of marketers on the way up um, following me on social. And one of the key lessons I would give to them that, that I took from your book as well is resilience and that, that desire to keep going. People will look and go, Moore's great company, Raw, you know, of course, Rand started this and, uh, you know, he's got the benefit of, exiting Moors now and, and doing this. But I think, did you say you wrote about 4,000 blog posts in your time at Moz? Um, yeah, probably something like that. <laughs> I can't remember the exact number in the book, but that there was a resilience to it and a kind of a focus and determination of you were writing four nights a week, every, you know, and I, I talked to clients and you're like, right, okay, we need to be doing this. It needs to be constant. We need to be at it. And like, oh, we could only write one blog post a month. Yeah. Which is not, that's not the end of the world, I don't think, right? Like, um, so Spark Toro, I have really dialed down my volume and I have tried to dial up the kind of quality and efficacy and, and value of the content that I create, right? So much more intentional. When I, was, when I was early, right, in my 20s and early 30s, like I was, yeah, I was blogging five nights a week, but it was, um, especially in those early years, it was a lot of dumb trial and error. Right? Like, let's see if this works. Let's see if that works. Let's see if this works. Let's see if that works. And then sort of I learned what worked. And now, you know, with SparkToro, well, I'm trying maybe once every week or two to publish something. Um, but every time I do, it is much more, uh, much more successful. Part of that's the channels that I've built, obviously. Part of that is the intuition around what's going to work. Mm -hmm. But I've seen, I've seen companies be very successful with one piece of content published a quarter as long as it is the right thing, like it's well targeted to solve the business problem that they want, right? Is that top of funnel, like we want to attract press and PR, we want to get our brand in front of people, we want people to know who we are. Um, I, you remember for a few years, I worked with a company called Jumpshot and a big part of their goal, right? With Clickstream data was like, get this idea of how we collect data and what we can do for organizations out in front of people. And so that, you know, they did, well, maybe a piece of content every quarter, like a big sort of um, big public study of data that they publish as a white paper, and then they do a webinar on it, and they do some distribution around it, and that was like their that was their content marketing right for the yeah. first few years. And it worked. Oh, um, so and like you say, it, it's I think the lesson there is you've got to do what's right for your organization with the resource you have available and and all of those things to factor in as well, and what what you're trying to achieve from it. Um. I, I want to come back to talk a little bit about pricing. Um, okay. Pricing is, a, is probably the most difficult part of marketing, often kept away from marketers because many marketers are hopeless at it. Um, but ra rather than dive into that element of the discussion, you're, you've got a lot of experience in trying to price SaaS products, uh, more than obviously now at, at Spark Toro. And I don't want you to justify the pricing. I want you to talk me through the thought process and the research that you did to get to where the pricing is for Spark Toro if yeah. you don't mind. Sure, sure. So uh, our, our intention with SparkToro's pricing was to focus on uh, a generous free tier that would help a lot of people um, and would be enough for a lot of people, right? Like give them, give them enough while also sort of showing off and teasing the product in a way that would you know, help con convert some folks. 
and uh, and then to have sort of pricing tiers that focused a little more on the um, higher end. So what, what I want to say is like uh, mid market agencies, mid market you know um, mid market uh, businesses, um, mid market independent consultants, those types of folks. Uh, finding the audience that really found SparkToro valuable long term, and um, and and thus that's why uh, we did a few things. One, we have sort of a steep price increase, price curve. So it goes from like you know zero, the free account, to 150 a month, to 300, and then 600. Um, and then uh, we have a pretty uh, robust and generous annual discount. So it goes down to like 100 and, 110 bucks or something, 112 bucks a year uh, for the, or, sorry, a month um, if you buy the yearly package. I think it's like a 30% discount, 25% discount, something like that. Um, and then we have this uh, unusual pricing structure where you can sign up for a week. We, we have, uh, I think we've had about 10 or 12 folks do this you can sign up for basically a week of extremely heavy access. If you're doing like a bunch of research for one client or one in-house project. And we knew that a ton of people that we talked to in our, in our uh, user interviews basically said, I do this kind of research once, maybe twice a year. So I don't need a subscription product. I need a, I pay you once, you give me all the data I want, right? And so we built a, a pricing structure. I think that's $450 for like up to a thousand searches. And it's sort of a very robust, you know, high end package for less than you would pay for the high end monthly, um, but more than you would pay for like the middle and, and low tier. Uh, but you only, you're, you're only charged for a week. We know there's no recurring billing yeah. uh, on that one. So it, it's a unique pricing thing. And I will say, Andy, you know, you say, <laughs> you are very generous to me when you say that I have a lot of experience with pricing mm -hmm. things. I would say I have a medium amount of experience. We, uh, you know, we talked to a few of our investors who are very sophisticated. Um, Rob Walling from MicroConf, who does a lot of, you know, pricing stuff in SaaS world. Uh, we worked with a couple of consultants, uh, Claire Sullentrop and Gia uh, uh, Georgiana Laudi from Elevate. We worked with them back in the fall of 2019 around our product. So, all of those folks kind of contributed to helping us price. I, I don't know if we have perfect pricing, right? We've been launched for 29 days. Mm -hmm. um, it wouldn't surprise me if we change prices sometime in the next couple of months based on feedback. Uh, and yeah, you know, I don't, I don't think anyone gets it perfect the first time. So I'm not even sure the concept of perfect pricing exists. Um, yeah. I, you know, there is always a, a tension between are we leaving too much money on the table? Uh, how, you know, if we nudge it here, how many do we lose? I, I'm not sure there is a perfect price point. It, it's, it's the thought process that gets you there. You know, you think, would you, did you consider a credits model instead of the seven day package? And right. you know, what, what, what were the discussions in there in terms of usability and uh, administration at your end? What, what were you thinking of? There? Those two things. One, it is very complicated on the tax side because you have to attribute the amount of revenue and so if someone has credits and they don't use them or when they use them do you attribute the revenue to that month blah 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 uh, the second problem with credits is it presupposes you're not going to build other features and one of the things that we know for example that we're, we're planning to build is a lot of like uh, overtime tracking of audiences that you want to follow and um, you know so you might plug in you know your own social and websites to to follow over time. And then the question is, are we, do we auto use up your credits to deliver your reports for those searches? How does that work? If we have multiple features, do the credits only work for some of them or not others? So we decided, no, let's just, we'll stick with monthly pricing or like a high use mm -hmm. one time package. That's how people use the tool anyway. Uh, whether that's perfect or not, I, I can't say uh, we have had probably at least three or four people ask us if we could charge them by the credit, maybe only three, but you know, some people have asked for it, which means there's demand. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah. Pricing is challenging. I think, you know, we'll probably know a lot more in a year than we do today. Good stuff. Good stuff. Well, I, I hope it goes well for you. It's back to I've, I've played around with the product. It looks a great tool. And uh, I certainly have my eye on the seven day package because I am one of those users. Oh, I need a little bit of that for a client to take it. 
spill it to right. them. Yeah, them. exactly. I mean, one of the nice things, one of the things we heard with uh, consultants and agencies in particular is they were like, I hate that SaaS products always charge me by the month because then I can't pass the billing through to my client. And, and we knew, oh yeah, people want to be able to just have, oh, this $450 expense, that's just part of our cost to serve you customer. Mm -hmm. And so we pass it on directly. Yeah, definitely. So that'd be useful. Um, I want to go back to talking about, well, about talking. Uh, you do a lot of talking at conferences. When, when we had conferences, do you remember them? <laughs> oh. <laughs> uh, the good old days, eh? Um, you talk a lot or you get asked to talk a lot about Google and you sort of have quite, um, quite a, a critic, I think it might be fair to say, of some of the things Google does. Um, talk to us a little bit about some of the problems you have with, with Google and how they operate. Yeah, I mean, I think the, the biggest problem that I have um, with Google overall is basically using their monopoly power in search, right? They have 95%, 94% of the search market, and, and they use that monopoly power to learn about um, behavior and, and about demand and then enter um, different verticals, niches, spheres, uh, in ways that feel pretty unfair to me, right? So, um, you know, I think that I think that Google has entered the travel field in a way that has, um, you know, for what the, I mean, the pandemic obviously has destroyed the travel industry. Mm -hmm. But even before that, Google was just uh, stealing a ton of the opportunity there. Same with local. Same with video, right? In in YouTube, essentially making YouTube the the way to get your video into Google. And you know, if you don't use that, you're kind of screwed. You can't get the video snippets. You probably won't show up in search. You know, using AMP to make sure that no one can get into Google News uh, unless you use their systems, right? Using um, and, and Google Discover. Uh, so just a whole bunch. I'm sure there's, mm -hmm. um, I've explored like 30 or 40 other ones, right? In Google Health and Google Finance and, um, Google flights, uh, and, and hotels, uh, some of the featured snippets stuff, just, just sector after sector, Google basically taking opportunity away from the rest of the web to give it to Google themselves. Right. And so when people ask me like, Hey, what's the, what's the secret to ranking number one in Google being owned by alphabet. <laughs> like, that's the secret. <laughs> Um, I've got a plan. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Right. You, if you would like to be number one in Google without any competition, right. It's not like, you know, when you're, when you're Google flights or when you're Google health or when you're Google finance wh or whatever it is, you don't have to compete with the rest of the search results, mm -hmm. right? You just automatically are number one. Google maps doesn't have to compete against Yelp. They don't have to compete against TripAdvisor. They don't have to compete against any of the startups or local businesses. They just automatically get to be number one mm -hmm. and, and that whole box takes up the top of the results. And they never seem to get whacked by uh, core updates either, do they? When they're, uh, <laughs> it, it's amazing how Google never struggle when, when there's a core update. They're never the ones complaining that they've lost rankings, are they? Uh, yeah, which is it's, so, it's so weird, right? And I mean, Google might, like Google makes these claims like, oh, well, you know, YouTube, whatever, because it's the most relevant, it's the best result. And I'm like, really? Because here's this, here's my evidence, right? YouTube is a great example of this. It's July 14th, 2000, or Ju July 11th, 2014. And 24 hours before that, if you crawled, you know, a few hundred thousand Google results, you would see tons of videos ranking in the results that are not from YouTube. Uh, Vimeo, Wistia, Daily Motion, you know, all, all these different places. And then suddenly on July 11th, July 12th, suddenly it's 98% YouTube. What, what, what happened there, right? Was it suddenly, suddenly one day YouTube's results got way, way better and everybody else sucked? No, it was someone from Google was like, hey, we own YouTube. Why, why are we ranking these other video sites? Stop giving them any oxygen. Like, let's make sure, let's use search to make sure we win in video. Mm -hmm. Ta-da! Yeah, when when you've got all the different levers vertically that you can pull, it it really helps to to build the business, doesn't it? And that's um, and I think that's what you were saying earlier with the antitrust and how they should be using those powers better. Um, yeah. 
I want to, to move to a, something I read that uh, Scott Galloway, Professor Scott Galloway, uh, fairly well known in the US, maybe less so here, but he is sort of uh, a well known, well known professor of marketing and uh, strategy. Um, it, because I think some of the things you talk about uh, are Google sort of incrementally taking over certain elements of business. And Scott has a different view on this. I'm going to read, I'm going to kind of paraphrase a long paragraph, but I'm going to read it to you. It says, um, sorry, I should be clear. This is about Apple, but earlier on in the piece, he sets it up. He's talking about Google, Microsoft and Apple and Amazon and, and how they're having to move into different sectors. So it says, uh, let's look at Apple. It does something like 250 billion a year in revenue. Apple has convinced stockholders its stock price will double in five years. Otherwise, they'll go and buy Salesforce or Zoom, the stockholders, that is. So to do that, Apple, to double its stock price, Apple needs to increase its revenue by 60 or 80%. As you move along, that means they basically have to go big game hunting. What he's saying is if they're going to keep to do that, they need to move into government, defense, education, or healthcare. Scott works in universities and he's saying they're going to move into healthcare, uh, to education, sorry, and that's going to be bad news for universities, especially those outside the top 25. They're going to get killed when Google, Apple, Amazon, Microsoft move in. Big game hunting, as he calls it. What, what's your view on that? Do you think that uh, Google's of this world are going to look and go, we need to move into government, defense, education and healthcare, or are they going to keep going into uh, gambling or um, you know, uh, travel and just kind of sports, do, yeah, 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 sports or doing whatever it is they do. Um, let's see. I think that Google has a relatively sophisticated way of analyzing all these different um, sectors and determining which ones they should and shouldn't put effort into. Uh, determining where you know some combination of opportunity and they have kind of the what to call it like legal and political support enough to immunize them from um, problematic you know, lawsuits or, or uh, government action. And obviously Google is uh, the, either the second or first largest lobbyer, uh, lobbyist in the United States and has been for a number of years. Uh, I think you know, they've, always, they've been in the top three for the last decade. Um, they support political campaigns. You know, we have this sort of like bribery is legal model in the US where you, you know, you, you can put unlimited amounts of cash into political campaigns. And so um, Google and Facebook and Amazon, right, they, they, they put a lot of money into campaigns of all kinds. Um, and they don't have to disclose much of that, depending on how they do it. Uh, so yeah, you, you get a really weird model. Um, so my, I don't know whether they'll go into education for sure. That seems like a guess on Scott's part. Um, not, not an uneducated one, it wouldn't surprise me. Um, Google looks like they, they are going more towards healthcare and finance than they are to education right now, but we'll see. Yeah, I mean, Scott is quite vociferous in, in his views on, uh, on education and where it's going, especially if you're outside the, the, say the top 25 schools yeah. like MITs and Harvards and things like that. Um, and, and I think he's right in so much as education has got a problem starting in September, October, when the, the new cohorts due to start Cambridge University in the UK just announced they're doing all their, uh, every lecture is going to be remote until September 21. That's yeah. a huge issue for, you know, if I was a student, the only thing I'd be looking at is a gap year, defer. Um, right. no, and, and that's absolutely so, right. Yeah. So I think he's diving I, I mean, into it, most of the, a lot of the analysis of education that I've seen is that you know the college, the the, the college degree and the college experience, uh, the degree is mostly a oh are you able like sort of are you in the financial bracket where you can jump through the hoops the right hoops to sort of prove that you're part of the global elite right and then the um, uh, the experience of college is more about the relationship building than the, you know, I learned this thing in history class. Um, and so uh, without those relationships that come from being in person, it's, it's pretty tough. And you and I know from conference world, event world, right, that networking is a huge part of how you get ahead in, in you know, business yeah. and life. And so no surprise that 
colleges are going to be very challenged to figure that mm -hmm. out. And I think from, from Scott's perspective and, and from the US perspective as well, that your system is, again, slightly different to the, what we have in the UK where fees are capped. So it doesn't, for a, a British student, it doesn't cost any more to go to Oxford University as it would to go to uh, Wolverhampton University, which isn't necessarily, doesn't have the prestige. Whereas in, in the US, the, the Ivy yeah. League, uh, you know, orders of yeah. magnitude higher. So, yeah. It's yeah, yeah. I mean, there's people who are, um, whose cost of tuition is more than I make in a year, right? <laughs> Jeez. Wow. Yeah. Frightening. Frightening. Um, you, you touched on politicians there about the lobbying that Google does. And I want to ask you about politicians before I kind of jump onto the last lap of, of the interview. Politicians, by their very nature, are generalists. You know, one day they could be looking at an environmental issue, the next right. day uh, abortion issues, the day after, you know, some obscure trade agreement with a, you know, the generalists. Yeah. What were your thoughts, though, when you were watching um, Google and Facebook being hauled in front of Senate to be asked questions? Did you feel they were asking the right questions? Did you feel they were equipped to ask the right questions? I know they obviously have researchers and people working for them, but what, what did you make of, of the spectacle of it? Um, I think that the unfortunate reality is that the most viral clips, the ones that, that sort of made their way to the general public, right, got on the top of Reddit, were, uh, I think, like two, two senators asking Zuckerberg the dumbest possible questions. Um, but if you, if you go and listen to the whole three and a half hours, you will be generally impressed. You'll be like, oh, the, these people seem smart and talented and they know what they're talking about. They're articulate, they're thoughtful, they're, they're, um, the critiques are, are the right kinds of ones, the questions are right. You know, I listened to the um, one where they were interviewing Google's general counsel um, and asking him questions about, uh, literally questions, you know, from some of my blog posts. And they, they even cited them, right? Because they, they were like, hey, this research from Rand Fishkin and Jump Shot says that uh, over the last few years, less than half of Google's uh, searches now, or less than half of clicks on Google result in a, a, a click to another website. Most of them stay on Google properties. Um, do you measure that? How do you measure that? Is that intentional on your part? Um, why have you made that change, right? Those, those kinds of things. And, um, and Google's responses were embarrassingly bad, embarrassingly bad. Um, just, you know, basically non-answers, mm -hmm. dodging. I don't care if you're a huge Google fan, you, you would look at that and go, Ooh. oh, that's, that's bad. That's really bad, right? And um, you can look at the follow-up questions that uh, Congressman, I think it's David Cicciolini from Rhode Island sent to Google after the testimony and those questions were really well done, really thoughtful. I tweeted about some of them. Mm -hmm. you know, so I think the, you know, the shitty part is we in the public mostly see the embarrassing stuff because that's what sells papers and gets clicks on Twitter and Reddit. Um, but there's a lot of good stuff there too. So I, I don't know. I was pretty impressed. I thought, uh, I thought they were wisely done. Good, good. Okay. Well, um, I have a couple of questions that I tend to ask a, a selection of these to all of the guests on the, on the show. So um, first one is about book recommendations. We've touched on Jim Collins. Um, I'm a fan. You're a fan. Uh, good to great, built to last. Uh, he's got a third one out, which I didn't know, but I, I'm going to go and get it anyway. But any other book recommendations for, for marketers? I love, if you work, if you work on teams at all, uh, I love, love, love this book from Liz Fossling and uh, Molly West Duffy called No Hard Feelings. Mm -hmm. I think this is just absolutely one of the best books I have read on bringing your emotions and, um, to work and on dealing with people and dealing with the, the challenges of uh, a modern work world. I, I, I can't recommend it enough. It, and it's really, it's really an easy, fun read too. Like you can see, I'll, yeah, great you know, pictures it's, it's got, and yeah, nice it's got these great and cartoons everything. that really resonate. If you follow them on Twitter, you can see Liz and Molly that that, that they put out these great cartoons. Um, so I love this book. I also, uh, Andy, I'd also strongly recommend if anyone hasn't read April Dunford's "Obviously Awesome," best book on positioning. If you can get her on the podcast, you should because oh my god. She so, is a genius. I met April at Learn Inbound in Dublin last August. I was hosting, she was presenting, and she, she closed the show. And 
it was fantastic. So I haven't reached out to her yet, but I am going to do because I do yeah, want April on the show. She yeah. blows me away, man. <laughs> yeah. Just amazing. just a real simplicity. It takes a very complete, what, what is a difficult enough concept, but yeah. and simplifies it in such a beautiful way that I, yeah, no, I think, I I think uh, so much of bad marketing is actually bad positioning. And if, if you get a chance to work with April or if you can just understand the concepts in her book and her work, um, you'll make a vastly better product, vastly better marketing uh, practice. Perfect. Brilliant. And what about um, advice to your 21 year old self? What, what do you wish you'd have known then? I wish I would joined a startup. Like I wish I had gone and worked for somebody else and seen what I liked and didn't like, even if it was a bad experience, I wish I'd done that. Um, I think it's uh, hubris that I, I thought I could just start my own thing without any experience. And I, I probably spent eight or 10 years learning something I could have learned in one or two uh, working for some other people. Interesting, because you started um, working with your mother, uh, yeah. as you talk about in the book. And Stacey McNaught, uh, who I think you might yeah, know as well, uh, work, she, yeah. she works with her mum as well. Um, and I have a thing called the Kath test, Kath being my mum, uh, who doesn't understand what I do and thinks I build websites. And I've given up the argument with her. But I've often, I, I quote the Kath test, where I, I have one time rang her during a meeting where the client was trying to make this really complicated thing sound even more complicated. I said, we're going to do the cath test. I'm going to ring my mum. I'm going to put her on loudspeaker. And I'm going to say, do you understand what this means? And we put her on. And I was like, so mum, it's a bloody bit. And she was like, not a bloody clue what that means. I'm like, Thanks. Talk to you later. Uh, done. Um, so mum's in business. Is this a good thing? Should everybody have their mum in the business? Um, no. No, I think, so. <laughs> no, I think uh, fam family uh, makes things very, very complicated. I've talked to a lot of people who have worked with siblings, parents, children, um, and, and yeah, business has a lot of complicated emotion stuff, complicated, um, um, you know, work stuff. And, and I don't, I don't necessarily think, I don't think that's right for everybody. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. Good answer. Thank you. So my last question, and after this question, I'm going to um, announce the competition question to win a copy of the book. So my last question goes the same to everybody. Is there anything that you expected me to ask you that I haven't? Oh, yeah. I thought we were going to talk more about uh, Donald Trump and, uh, you know, taking uh, various medications and, and um, whether lizard people control underground sex dungeons for children in pizza parlors um, but maybe that's a different podcast. I don't know. I know that's the, uh, I could put that on a, maybe a <laughs> version afterwards as well, but, uh, it, yeah, Trump, give, give us your 60 second synopsis that won't get you arrested or, or put in some sort of Guantanamo Bay, Guantanamo Bay dungeon, uh, sure. on the president. Uh, well, I think that, you know, the sad thing is if we had, um, any, any, previous presidential administration in the United States, uh, Republican or Democrat, from the last hundred years, uh, we, would, we would absolutely be in a much better situation with regards to the pandemic, right? This, this one is exclusively poorly built, uh, poorly structured for this type of a challenge where you need a lot of um, non-politicized health information to reach people. You need you know, sort of togetherness, you need um, a very structured approach, you need a combination of, of states working well with federal government. Um, and obviously, this administration is very different in their approach to all, all, all of those things, very, very politicized. Um, I think we're one of the only two or three countries in the world that have politicized COVID. Almost every other country, you see more support for leadership um, the United States and Brazil are, are some of the only places where it's not true. So yeah, sad, I, I, really sad. And both those countries with, with leaders who are um, almost parodies of each other as well. Yeah, um, yeah. yeah, I think that, that, that sort of, you know, um, nationalism meets racism meets um, corruption. Yeah, it's a very, it's a, it's a weird model, right? It's, it's something that I think, you know, five years ago, every Republican in the US would have said, I am fundamentally against all those things. And then as soon as it was someone in their party, they're like, oh, it's fine. It's cool. Yeah. I think the best comment I heard about uh, Donald Trump was that um, he, he, made, he makes George W. Bush look competent. 
Oh, um, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I think, I, mean, of I think I think Bush did terrible, terrible things. You know, uh, the Iraq war was just just awful um, and, and horrific. But the uh, he is a competent executor of the office. And, and, and this guy uh, is anything but which no, no surprise. Right. He could barely run a real estate business, whereas, you know, he had inherited bar- billions of dollars and he sort of like performed worse than if he put it into a mediocre stock fund. Um, so, yeah. Meh. Yeah. I mean, uh, to use a very Northern fra- Northern English phrase, you know, don't think you could find his ass with both hands. Uh, yeah, I, be, you, yeah. I mean, you, really, I could sort of walk into a grocery store and take anyone in the grocery store just randomly. And they would almost certainly do a better job in ex- ex- um, executing the office of president. Right. And so it's just, a, I don't know. That's weird. Yeah. It's, yeah. Good luck, him. Good luck with him. Good luck with him. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, look, I, I've teased it a couple of times. Uh, Rand's book, Lost and Founder. Um, I have not this copy. I'm going to keep this copy, but I'm going to have, have another copy to give away to someone with a competition. So here is how we're going to do this as soon as I can find the right piece of paper. If you go to my website, eximomarketingstrategy.com forward slash podcast, you'll see there's an entry form on there. Uh, This show goes out on the 9th of June. It is going to be there for 10 days because I want to announce it on the next show. Um, The question is, uh, what city are you in right now, Rand? That's not the question. Seattle, Washington. Seattle, Washington. The question is, what is the name of the soccer team based in Seattle? So... If you can answer that and you want a copy of Lost and Founder, go to eximomarketingstrategy.com forward slash podcast. There'll be an entry box on there. Fill in the entry and we will pick a winner at random. Uh, And we can ship anywhere in the world, you know. Um, I'm I'm not fussy. We'll send it anywhere we like. So we'll pick a winner at random and I will announce that on the next show in two weeks' time. Uh, Rand, thank you very much for your time. It's been brilliant. Um, We could possibly go forever talking about... uh, IPOs, uh, raising finance, a whole bunch of stuff, but I try to keep it focused on the marketing element. But thank you for your time. It's been amazing. Yeah, Andy, thank you for having me. Take care. So there you have it. That is your United States of America edition over and done with. Uh, We had Greg Gifford talking local search. We've had Ron Fishkin talking about lots of things. The marketing flywheel about building a, another tech company, um, about uh, COVID-19, the impact that that's had on businesses, and, and all, about all sorts. Um, great conversation with Rand. Please do check out his book, Lost and Founder. Um, if only because it will make you sing, Midnight at the Lost and Found. Uh, uh, and it had made me go into a death spiral of meatloaf songs for a little while. So two out of three ain't bad. Uh, Bat Out of Hell. Um, uh, what, what was the other one? I won't do that. No, no. Anyway, that one. Terrible. Uh, which was probably the worst 24 hours of my life. So thanks for that, Rand. Anyway, regardless of that, do you want to win a copy? As I said um, on the interview with Rand, we have a copy of Lost and Founder to give away. If you want to win that, just go to eximomarketingstrategy.com slash podcast. It's in the show notes. It's under the video. Just click on the link and go there fill in the entry form and in 10 days time I'm going to pick a winner at random and that winner will get the book doesn't matter where you are in the world I'm sure we'll find somebody will ship it to you so if you want to win the book get in touch and we'll see where we go from there Uh, next week is a new episode we're going to talk about luxury brands if you've never looked at luxury marketing before talking serious high-end brands not just nice brands serious high-end brands um You've never experienced anything quite like it. Luxury operates like nothing else on the planet. It is a very strange counterintuitive marketing segment. So we're going to get into that with somebody who spent a career in luxury and uh, it should be an interesting time and an interesting listen. So please do hit subscribe uh, wherever you're listening, whether that's YouTube, whether that's um, Acaster, um, Spotify, Apple, Google, wherever. Please do subscribe. And if you there is an opportunity to rate the show, please do rate it. Five stars would be fantastic. But if you don't want to do five stars, still rate it anyway. All of that helps the show. It helps more people discover it. It helps the show be found. It helps it go into different charts and things like that. So please do 
uh, uh, download it, share it with your friends if you can, rate it, review it, that would be lovely. This show wouldn't happen if it wasn't for Inside Voice, Aaron and the guys there. I am great at waffling occasionally, none of it really makes any sense most of the time, but they put it together, edit it and uh, put something slick out there. I would still be flapping around in the world of I might launch a podcast soon if it wasn't for Aaron and his help. And lastly, just another shout out to the sponsor, Moyi Coffee. Please do check them out. Uh, if you're in the market for buying some coffee, give the guys a go. Um, M-O-Y-E-E coffee.ie or .co.uk. Please do try them out. So we'll see you again every two weeks on a Tuesday. Thank you for listening to the Strategy Sessions. My name is Andy Jarvis. Hopefully catch you next time. Yeah.